The life of Oak Park native Ernest Hemingway is the subject of Ken Burns and Lynn Novick's newest PBS documentary set to air on Channel 11 Monday after Chicago Tonight. Here's a short clip about his seemingly idyllic childhood in the western Chicago suburb. Ernest Miller Hemingway was born July 21st, 1899, the second of six children, and enjoyed what seemed to be an idyllic boyhood. He had four adoring sisters and a worshipful younger brother. They all lived in a big, comfortable home in the prosperous Chicago suburb of Oak Park, a complacent, well-mannered community with no saloons and so many churches it liked to call itself Saint's Rest. Now, Oak Park looks exactly the same now as it does in those pictures. And joining us to talk about the legendary writer is Verna Kale, professor of English and associate editor of the Hemingway Letters Project at Penn State University. Welcome to Chicago Tonight. Hi. So we did an event for WTTW members with Ken Burns and Lynn Novick about this. And the film starts off with his childhood in Oak Park, as you saw. It's a hot topic among locals there that <laughs> he referred to it as a, quote, place of broad lawns and narrow minds. I say he never said that. So how did Oak Park uh, influence who he would become? Um, I think his childhood in Oak Park was very important for Ernest Hemingway. Um, he had a good education there as a student and a lot of opportunities to, um, you know, go into Chicago and go to the art museums and the, the natural history museums and to participate in community events in Oak Park. You know, we know he took music lessons and um, he read widely and, and he was um, in little programs at church and things like that. So I think uh, growing up, he had, you know, kind of a, a rich um, education and exposure to the arts. And I think that that probably had uh, a good, good effect on him as a um, a young man who would grow up to, to be a famous writer. And of course, some of those pictures we saw, he's up at his family's vacation compound in Walloon Lake, Michigan. And as I mentioned, we did an event for WTTW members. We talked to Ken Burns. I posed a question to Burns about Oak Park and then the war's influence on Hemingway. Take a look. You have a Victorian world slamming up against the First World War. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing that's going to survive that contradiction. As we say in the film, everything his parents had prepared him for was no more. That world is gone. So as you all know, Verna, he goes off to war, he comes back, and, and he starts to build the myth of Ernest Hemingway as he starts his writing career. What, why was it so important to him to create this mythologized version of himself? Um, well, you know, we have to remember that when he comes back from the war, he's really young. And he's still um, trying to figure out who he is and what he's going to be. And he felt that he was going to become a writer. But up until that point, you know, beyond just publications for school, um, you know, he, he hadn't managed to write any fiction. You know, he had worked um, as uh, a journalist. He had worked um, writing uh, sort of, ad copy not very successfully but he hadn't yet made his made his mark as a fiction writer and so you know he's trying to present himself in a way that's going to launch him into this world that he wants to be a part of and it's kind of interesting to think of it that you know he didn't yet know for sure that he was going to be able to do that but he was a he was a guy who really um loved uh, excitement and friends and, you know, living life to the fullest. And so it's, it's kind of um, charming in a way to see that side of him. And also a little bit, you know, if we look at it as a possible reaction to the trauma of war that he had experienced, you know, we can also look at it in that way as well and, and feel some sympathy for him. And in the film, you know, there's a narrator that says the, the reality of Ernest Hemingway was more interesting than the myth. And it's not as if it was a total myth. I mean, he hunted in Africa. He was a fisherman. I mean, he did all these uh, masculine things, so to speak. Um, but you have been privy to all his personal letters. What, what was the reality behind the myth? Uh, there's, there's a great quote in the film um, of his wife, Hadley, saying that he had so many sides that he defied geometry. And that's really true because 
it is really hard to nail down who was the real Ernest Hemingway because he really did have all of these different aspects to his personality. Um, so he really was the great adventurer. Um, he really was the literary guy, but you know, he also had uh, a sensitive side. You know, he could be a devoted father and and husband and friend. He could get his feelings hurt yeah. by his friends. That's one kind of surprising aspect that we see in the letters is, um, you know, a lot of the raging that he does and blustering on the surface. It's part of him, you know, reacting badly to being snubbed in a review or being snubbed by a friend. And so you get a sense that he was actually kind of a sensitive guy. Right. You, he clearly wanted the adoration of the public and the fame that he got. We haven't even talked about his writing style yet. <laughs> uh, uh, there's so many things we could talk about, but, you know, one theme that constantly pops up is death in his short stories, uh, in his later work. Talk about how death kind of is the overarching theme in so much of his work. Yeah, it, it definitely shows up in his work. Um, and I, w one of the passages that I just find so interesting is in um, A Farewell to Arms, where there's the, um, when the, you know, the main character, Frederick Henry, um, gets wounded and he feels his soul mm. or something pass out of his body. And then there's this interior monologue where he's like, oh, it was wrong to think that it just ends. This is what happens. And you, you get this very vivid description of what it feels like to die and then go back into your body. And you can't help but wonder, did Ernest Hemingway take this description from his own experience of, of you know, being blown up um, on the banks of the Piave River. And so if he's obsessed with death, maybe it's because, you know, that's something that he confronted at a young age. And, you know, one of the themes that, that goes through his work is life as a fixed race, because you know you're not going to survive it. Every, yeah. And, you know, there's the title of that short story collection, Winner Take Nothing. You right. know, everybody's eventually going to meet death. And so he's just, yeah, his his... His work really does explore that idea. And, and we only have a few seconds left, but the, the style, the short declarative sentences were, were so crucial to, to his work. How did that impact American writing after, after his I think, career? I think it changed it forever. You know, he, he wanted to have you know, big ideas with uh, as, as simply stated as he could make it. And um, that has been something that people have gone on to emulate to such a degree that it really permanently changed short stories and the novel and, and creative nonfiction as well. All right. Well, there's so much to unpack here, and there's six hours of a documentary to <laughs> unpack with Ernest Hemingway. Our thanks to Verna Kale. And the three-part documentary premieres Monday on WTTW right after Chicago Tonight. And up